Good afternoon, everyone. Now we're moving into the second half of water treatment. And our objectives for today are to look at the second half of the treatment process, which includes flocculation, sedimentation, disinfection, and finally filtration. And then technically, there's also some advanced treatment options that we could look at, but you could look at that in your textbook as well. So what are our three objectives? First, we're going to learn how to design a flocculation tank, a sedimentation tank, and typical filters that are used for the filtration, filtration process. Second, we're going to identify typical disinfection methods. And then third, we're going to discuss water distribution system requirements. How can we properly operate a water distribution system all the way from the source to your tap? Now, this is just a brief reminder from the first part of the lesson. The water treatment design standards are the 10 state standards for New York State, again, also known as the GLRM standards, which stand for the recommended standards for water works. And this was developed by the Great Lakes Upper Mississippi River Board. That includes not only a series of states in the United States, but also some uh, principalities in Canada. If you would like a link to the 10 states so that you could look at the text directly, I highly recommend you download this PDF. And the reason why is you'll be needing this to go through some of the state standards as you do your next homeworks, homework six and seven. So what is the drinking water quality that we need to look at? So from last class, we looked at the very beginning of the phases, and we even discussed some uh, typical design equations, which we'll go to in just a moment. But now we're going to move to the series of phases where you go through flocculation, which allows all of the coagulants that have been added during the rapid mix phase to, al to collide into different particles or organic materials or pathogens to start to get them to clump together. Again, this is a rather short phase as well. Then we move to settling, where we move with very slow velocities over a long period of time, so a long detention time and the materials are allowed to settle to the bottom of the tank or to float to the top and removed. And then any remaining material is sent through a filter so that you can separate out the water from any other particles. Now, if there's still some pathogens that are left, we may add a uh, disinfectant such as fluoride, I'm sorry, chlorine, and then we may also add a, an additional uh, material such as fluoride, but that's for aesthetic purposes. And then finally, we distribute it out to the general public. Just as a reminder, some of the equations we will be using today, if you want to calculate detention time, overflow rate, or weir loading, we'll be using these and comparing these values to the 10 state standards. So let's start first with flocculation. What happens there? So again, as we said, the phase right before is rapid mix mixing. And the purpose of rapid mixing is to disperse the chemicals, to get it evenly throughout the tank. Now, again, if it's a circular tank, as, a, as you can see on the bottom right, the, the chemicals are typically dispersed by a center panel. Or, this is also known as plug flow, the flow moves from one direction to the other, and the chemicals are dispersed as they move from, say, the left to the right. And again, the purpose of rapid mixing is to evenly disperse the particles throughout the tank. And then as you move towards flocculation, the chemicals are allowed to collide with different organic materials, and we begin to clump together. And then we start to get some settling at the bottom. And again, or we may float to the top if there's more of a, a grease or a fat mixture to the, to the uh, organic material. The liquid mixture is known at this point as flock. Again, it's called, instead of calling just influent water or effluent water, it's called a, a flock material. And again, typically we move to the next phase, which is sedimentation, in which the flock is allowed to settle to the bottom or float to the top. Now, what are some of the 10 state standards? Before we go to that, some typical dimensions or recommended dimensions for a flocculation tank, whether it's rectangular, or circular, again, depends on how, what type of ratios we're looking to, uh, to obtain. 
So some recommended values for depth, width, and length are given in your textbook as table 5.2. What the aspect ratio between the length and width typically are. And typically the tank material is concrete. And again, you will see things like this when you go to your field trip. For a circular tank, typically the depth is between 9 and 14 feet. And the diameter can range anywhere from 25 to 200 feet in diameter. That's a substantial difference. Now, this depends on how many tanks you're trying to run and how much literal um, space that you have as part of your property. So some of the 10 state standards that we, living in New York, need to adhere to, I highlighted the two that would, that would come to your attention most, again, at least through this design process in this lecture. And they have to do particularly with detention time. And we'll practice this in our first problem. Detention time should be at least 30 minutes. So again, just remember this. And the flow through velocity should be no less than 0 0.5 and no greater than 1.5 feet per minute. Again, the reason behind this is you want to make sure that you have enough speed or enough velocity which is the 0 0.5 feet per minute, you want to make sure you have enough velocity so that you do not allow too much of the flock to settle out too soon, because that will occur in the sedimentation tank. But at the same time, you don't want too high a velocity, because you want to allow there to be a significant amount of collision, and then you want to be able to move the particles to the next phase of sedimentation. Some of these others, and there's more design standards for flocculation. This is just truncated to show you some of the design standards, and again, particularly for detention. So again, I recommend highly that you get section 4.2.3 and just read through it briefly to make sure you meet all of the criteria. So let's do an example for flocculation. So and this is an example of a circular tank. Flocculation and sedimentation tanks can be put together as one process. So again, in the example that we're doing here, we're separating out the flocculation versus sedimentation. But you can put them together in one. So example number one says, determine the volume and diameter of a circular flocculation tank that is 10 feet deep and needs for a highly turbid water that has an average flow of 1,000 gallons per minute, a velocity gradient of 1,000 per second, and a G a time, a gradient time factor of 100 and 120,000 seconds per second. Compare the detention time to the 10 state standards. Now, for this example, I refer you to page 5.6 in your text, where there's a formula that's used specifically for flocculation. So let me give it to you here before we begin. So a recommended formula is the ratio of velocity gradient to t sub 0 is equal to 1 divided by flow I'm sorry, I'm looking at, looking at the wrong ratio. Let's clear that for a second. Actually, it's just simply T sub 0 is equal to G T sub 0. This is based off of your formula for rapid mixing. And this will give us a recommended detention time. So for step A, determine Detention time T, and again, we'll use the formula up above. So then T sub 0 is equal to G T sub 0 of 120,000. Again, that's seconds per second. Divided by a velocity gradient. of 1,000 per second.
And then also, since seconds and seconds cancel in the numerator, and since the seconds in the denominator would pop up into the numerator, I'm going to immediately multiply by 60 seconds in one minute. So I get this answer in minutes. Again, because detention time is typically recommended in minutes, and that way we can compare to the 10 state standards. So this calculation gives us approximately 20 minutes of detention time. Now, if we go back to our 10 state standard, technically, if we were in New York, we should be at least 30 minutes. So this design would not be sufficient in New York, but again, it may be adequate in other states or if you've gotten a waiver. So for the sake of this example, we'll continue forward, but just as a note, we'll make a note that this is not greater than 30 minutes. So it's no good for 10 state standards. Now, what you could do, if this is an example that you're doing for, say, your homework, what you would do is you would just say the, the initial time that was calculated was 20 minutes. However, according to the 10 state standards, we need a minimum of 30. So you would just increase your time to 30 minutes or more, and you would continue your calculation. So now that we know what the detention time is, let's determine the total velocity based on that time. So we're going to determine volume. And again, using just the simple formula of Q is equal to V on T, I'm going to rearrange that such that V is equal to Q times T. Our flow is 1,000 ga thousand gallons per minute. Again, our time is 20 minutes. But we'd like to convert that into cubic feet, which is a lot more convenient for us to work in. So I'm going to divide that by. 7.48 gallons per cubic foot. You could have flipped this ratio and multiplied it, but just for the sake of space, I did it as a division. So again, gallons and gallons cancel, minutes and minutes cancel, and that gives me a total volume of 2,674 cubic feet. Now, since the problem specifically said the volume and diameter, we know that we're working with a circular tank. So I'll use the second half of this side to calculate the diameter of the pipe, of the tank. We already know that the tank depth has been specified as 10 feet. So let's determine the diameter, volume is equal to area times diameter, and again we're searching specifically for diameter that we want to take the volume and divide it by the area. Our volume was 2,674 cubic feet. Divide that by the area, which we'll calculate directly. So we have pi 10 foot diameter squared divided by 4. 
that should give us a diameter of 18.4 feet. Now, for the sake of more of a more typical diameter, you could recommend 18.5 feet. But again, what you'll want to do is you'll want to go back and make sure that you have a detention time of at least 20 minutes. Or what you can do is round down, and you'll probably get a, actually, that might be more of a shorter detention time. So either way, you could leave it at 18.4 feet. But if you want to change it to more manageable construction dimensions, you need to go back and just make sure you meet your minimum detention time. And if that's so, then you can recommend it. So for the sake of this problem, we're going to try a 10-foot diameter, oh, sorry, a 10-foot depth, excuse me, and an 18-point four foot diameter. So that would be our design for the flocculation tank. And again, if you want to make it more manageable or easier to scale, you could round up to 18.5 or down to 18.4. But again, just run through your calculations to make sure you meet whatever standard you're trying to meet at that time. Now, a very similar process is also followed for sedimentation design. And again, the purpose of sedimentation is to give enough time so the detention times are substantially longer. You want to give enough time so that when you have an inflow of what we call our flock into the tank, the lighter particles that will tend to float will float to the top, and they can be scraped off the top. Or as the larger particles of flock start to adhere to one another, and again, since we have much slower velocities, the larger particles will settle towards the bottom. As that happens, typically there's a, a little paddle or screen that will move or conveyor belt, and that will move the flock off to, say, some sort of disposal unit, and then it can be removed. The clearer or better treated effluent will overflow from a weir and will be collected and will move to the, the next phase, which is filtration. Now, the sedimentation phase depends on a few different types of terms. Sedimentation depends on the water density and viscosity and it also depends on the sediment shape, size, and specific gravity that you're trying to remove. Now, what are the 10 state standards that govern sedimentation? Again, as a highlight, detention time shall be a minimum of four hours. And I just want you to keep that in mind. That's significantly more than the flocculation time of 30 minutes. So again, sedimentation should be at least four hours if you're designing for a treatment plant in New York or one of the 10 states that we fall under. Also, the outlet through which we have the flow go over the weir, the weir should not exceed 20,000 gallons per day per linear foot of weir. And then finally, the velocity through the settling basin should not exceed 5.5 feet per minute. And again, we want to make sure that we allow a low enough velocity so that the larger particles have the opportunity to settle without being disturbed or kicked up at the bottom of the tank. So let's do an example where we're going to use, get a similar procedure that we use for flocculation. So sedimentation, we have a rectangular tank, and this is an inline tank. And how it works, and I'll try to highlight, is you have your influence from the flocculation tank coming in, and then as we move from left to right, the heavier particles start to settle out. So what you'll start to see, and again, I'll show it on the image to the right, the heavier particles start to settle down to the bottom. And again, since we have a sloped tank, 
they will start to collect at the bottom of the tank. This is known as sludge. And then the sludge will be removed. And oftentimes, it's disposed of in a landfill. Or if it can be treated, it can be used for agricultural purposes, such as compost. Now, as the flow moves through, it goes over the weirs at the right-hand side of the tank. So what's shown here with these four rectangular portions, these are four weirs that the flow spills over into, and then finally out into the next phase, which is filtration. So for this design, a sedimentation portion of an inline treatment plant is to be designed. The proposed design for the sedimentation tank is 140 feet wide, 280 feet long, and 17 feet deep. The length of the effluent weir along the four channels at the end of the tank is 1,260 feet. So these four weirs that are shown, if you were to follow from the top, and follow along this line and around and down and around and down all the way through. This entire linear length is 1,260 feet. That is what the flow is flowing over. So being asked to calculate the major parameters used to size the unit for a flow of 40 million gallons per day, and then compare it to the 10 state or GLRM standards. So we'll go through it. What I did was I copied the text from the problem just so we can refer to it. So the first thing, the three terms that we found to be significant were detention time, we are loading, and overflow rate. So let's compare and see how these end up from the 10 state standards. So again, first we'll calculate detention time. And detention time is simply velocity or excuse me, volume overflow. And the volume is the length, width, and height of the tank. We're assuming that we're using the full 17 feet of the, of the tank because the weirs are at the top of the tank and the flow goes over the top of the tank. So we have 140 feet times 280 feet. times 17 feet. Divide that by our flow of 40 million gallons per day. Now I hope you would like this. This is a convenient conversion factor between cubic feet per second and millions of gallons per day. One cubic foot per second is equal to 0 0.6463 million gallons per day. So our MGD, cancel our MGD. Our cubic feet, cancel our cubic feet in the numerator. So that should give us a detention time of approximately 10,767 seconds, which is approximately 180 minutes which is three hours. Now, if we compare that to the 10 state standards, just backing up for a moment, for the 10 state standards, if we're designing in New York, we need a minimum of four hours. So we'll just state that this design does not meet the 10 state standards. So this is not greater than four hours. So this is no good. Now, what would this mean? What would we need to do? Essentially, we would probably have to make the tank larger to slow down the flow and increase the detention time. 
So that's what you would do on the project. You would change the dimensions of the tank, maybe make the tank longer, maybe not as wide. So again, so you can increase your detention time. Again, just as an example, and this often happens when we do a design where we may use some typical standards for dimensions. We'll calculate them, and then we'll find that that doesn't meet our design standards, so we have to make some adjustments. So the next factor we want to look at, we want to calculate our velocity, because we'll be needing that. So determine velocity, because again, we had a requirement for flow through velocity. Velocity is simply equal to flow divided by area. Again, notice we're just taking terms that we learned in fluid mechanics and just manipulating those equations. Now, one thing that we'd like to do We'd like to make some of the units more convenient. We'd like our velocity to be in feet per minute so that we can compare to the 10 state standard. If we look at our portion from the previous problem, the 40 million gallons divided times 1 cubic foot per second divided by 0.6463 million gallons per day, if you were to calculate that, you get your flow in cubic feet per second. So I'm going to use that. If I calculate that, if I do 40 divided by 0.6463, that gives me 61.9 cubic feet per second. And if I divide it by the area of the tank, and again, this is the surface area, I'm sorry, the flow through area moving from left to right. So let me just show you our diagram again. So as we're moving through, we're concerned about the width of the tank and the depth of the tank, because that is the area as we're moving from left to right. It's actually not the length of the tank, which is the 280. So again, we're interested in 17 feet by 140 feet as our cross-sectional area. So our 17 feet times 140 feet. And that gives us approximately 0 0.026 feet per second. And if we convert that into feet per minute, that's approximately 1.6 feet per minute. Now, how does that compare to this 10 state standard? So again, the goal is not to exceed half a foot per minute. So again, in this particular example, our velocity is too high. So what we would do is we would need to slow it down. So again, by making the tank longer, we would slow down the velocity. So that's something that we would do as part of changing our, our design. I know you're thinking, wow, nothing's working in this design. And that's OK. What you'll often find is you need to go do a little back and forth, because there's a, the, the equation but then there's also the best practice of the design standard, which there's certain, certain types of parameters they would prefer you to stay in. So this is not less than half a foot per minute. So this is basically telling us as we go that we need to go back and look at our design. But let's continue so that we go through all of the different terms. 
We also have to calculate the wheel loading. And the wheel loading is simply the flow divided by the total wheel length. So again, our flow is 40 million gallons per day divided by the total wheel length, which was given as 1,260 feet. And this we can actually do directly. So if you do 40 million divided by 1260, you'll get 32,000 gallons per day per foot. So let's go check again what the 10 state standard says. Boy, we're not doing too well, are we? So again, it said the, the rate of flow over the outlet weirs or through an orifice shall not exceed 20,000 gallons per day per linear foot. Well, unfortunately, we exceeded that yet again with our 32,000. So again, what does that mean? That would mean that we would need more length of weir. So we would just have to introduce more weir in our design. So what you would do as part of this problem, as part of your design, you would go back and adjust your weir length until you've reduced it to 20,000 gallons per day per foot or less. Again, not a problem. This is helpful so that we can see how we can troubleshoot our problems to make sure we actually work within our, our state standards. So again, it's really not less than gallons per day per linear foot. So again, unfortunately, that's no good as well. But again, we would adjust it as part of our design. And finally, there's an overflow rate. There is no uh, state standard for this, but we'll calculate it more for our own information. And the overflow rate, V0, is Q divided by A. So we want to take our 40 million gallons per day divided by our area. And this is actually the surface area that we're interested in. What, what flow is being lifted up through the tank and over the weirs? So 140 feet times 280. So if you take 40 million and divide it by that area, you get an overflow rate of 1,020 gallons per day for every square foot of tank. So again, this is more just in for information purposes, just to see what type of rate, how much flow are you getting through every square foot of tank that you've installed. Now that we've discussed flocculation and sedimentation, now we're go going to move on to filtration. The purpose of filtration is, again, to move the flow which has already been somewhat treated through a more finer refinement to try to remove such as the non settable flock that remains. So again, this may be additional silt or clays. It may be additional bacteria that's large enough to be trapped in the filter. And there's different mechanisms by which you can do it. The example shown here is an example of a gravity filter, where the flow is brought in at a higher elevation and then through gravity moves through the filter then through the, the graded gravel is to keep the filter media in place. We don't want to wash the filter media out. So the treated effluent moves through the gravel, gra uh, the graded gravel. And then it moves to an under drain, which will move to further treatment, which is typically disinfection. So some typical design criteria that we use for filter bed design. Again, these are just general criteria to give you a sense of where to start. A filtration rate of 1 to 10 gallons per minute for every square foot of filter. 
thickness is approximately 10 to 18 inches, perhaps even more, say 24 to 30. We typically use sand and gravel, and we may also use additional uh, activated carbon, which, is, which also removes um, other materials such as taste and odor. These filters are typically square in cross-section, and we often use multiple filters for redundancy. So if one filter has to be taken out of service to be cleaned, you don't stop the entire operation. We typically calculate a filtration loading rate similar to an overflow rate. It's, very, it's the same, same concept, where we look at the flow moving through the system compared to the total surface area of our filters. Now, we also need to consider flow control. One main issue that we have with filters is that they often have to be cleaned and maintained. So in order to do that, how this typically works is you have, during normal operation, so again, if you look at our, our different values for the valve, so we have, so 1 and 4 is for typical infiltration processes. So how would that work? Your settled water influent would go in through valve number 1 and up and over. So again, that's to slow the flow down because, again, we want very slow movement so that it can move by gravity through the filter media into the gravel. And then it's removed from valve number 4 into a well where we have our clear effluent. Now, again, when the filter begins to get clogged, we need to backwash the system. So we use valve 5 and 2. So again, in this case, we have different types of uh, sediment in the filter here that's clogged. So we want to wash it out. So we'll reverse it by backwashing the flow into valve number 2. And then we will send it off for disposal, or we may send it through the system again to be, to be uh, further treated. But we'll need a source of water. So again, pumps from backwashed water. So again, this may be water that we've already treated, or from another source. We'll have water come in through the backwash, force the flow in reverse, send all of the, all of the, um, the material that has gathered into the pores of the filter, out through valve number two to disposal. And then finally, we need to flush the system so we can get it back into its original state. And that will use valve number one and three. So again, we'll send in our treated water, our untreated water from our uh, sedimentation tank. We'll allow it to settle. So again, the filter media will, will go back to its original state. So again, when you backwash it, you may kick up some of the filter media and unsettle it. So we allow the filter media to settle through this process by forcing it through gravity filtration. But again, this, the filter is not properly set, so we'll have some contaminated water that we don't want to put into our well. So again, we will send this off to disposal as well. We won't send it to our, our clear water well. Once we've allowed it to adequately flush the system and clear everything out and resettle our media, then we'll go back to valves 1 and 4, and we'll have our regular operation through gravity filtration, and then back into the well. Now, what does a typical filter medium look like? We've talked about sand and gravel, but we may also add anthracite, which is essentially coal. And this became more common because this will also reduce the amount of times we need to backwash our system, but also it has the additional benefit of removing that taste and odor that if we're using it for drinking water, people would like to enjoy. So we have coal. And you think about it, it's much like your British filtration system. It acts in the same way. Then you have sand. Then we move to a coarse sand, because you can't jump directly from, say, a fine sand to a gravel. The fine sand will plug or clog the gravel pores. So we try to do more of a gradation from more of a fine sand to a coarse sand to a gravel and then drain the flow to our, to our well. Now, there are many different types of filtration standards, and it depends on the type of filter that you use. Today, we spoke of the rapid rate gravity filter, and also you'll use that for your homework as well. So I highly recommend you go to that section to 431 
and just take a look at some what of the different requirements are for that type of filter because you will need to satisfy those as part of your homework. So let's do an example of filter medium. Let's calculate a loading rate. So a filter unit has two 15 by 15 filters. After filtering 2.5 million gallons of water in a 24 hour period, the filter is backwashed at a rate of 15 gallons per minute per foot squared for 12 minutes. Compute the average filtration rate and compare to the 10 state standards for rapid rate gravity filter. Now in this problem there's more information than needed, so we'll just wade through it and see what we actually need to use. So in order to calculate a loading rate, we'll do that first. So determine the loading rate. The loading rate and the filtration rate are the same. So our loading rate is equal to the flow divided by the total area of the filters. So we have 2.5, make that more of a period for you, 2.5 million gallons per day divided by, we have two filters and each filter is 15 by 15 feet. But again, I'm going to continue, and again, I may need to change my color up a bit here so I can write over my, write over my diagram for a second. I want to do some conversions immediately so I can get it in gallons per minute per foot squared. So again, just looking at some additional things I have. And if that's millions of gallons per day, and in one day, I have 24 hours. And in one hour, I have 60 minutes. When we do our calculation, and I'll move back to my white pen, you get a loading rate equal to 3.9 gallons per minute per foot squared. Now if you were to go check the 10 state standards for rapid rate gravity filter, they typically re recommend between 2 to 4 gallons per minute per foot, per foot squared. So again, this is good because we are in between that 2 to 4 gallons per minute per foot squared. And this is a recommended range. You could actually go slightly above and below that. But again, according to best practice for, for the 10 state standards, that's the recommendation. So now that we've done filtration, sedimentation, and flocculation, the last phase is disinfection. And disinfection can have different types of processes. You can either do it with physical means, or with chemical means to remove the remaining pathogens, if any, from your drinking water so that it's safe to drink. The physical method can be done with UV light, electronic radiation, gamma radiation, sound, or heat. Chemical processes can be done with chlorine, ozone, halogens, different types of metals, alcohols, soaps, and detergents. But by far the most common type is chlorine. So oftentimes we add chlorine into our water system to uh, remove the pathogens and then we treat it to remove the chlorine from there. 
So after we've done all of these processes and we've disinfected the water and now it's in a state where people can drink the water, how is the water actually delivered to you? So the typical system that we go through is we have our supply from precipitation, then it's moved to a reservoir where it's protected and stored, then it's treated, and again the entire process we spoke of is the treatment process, then we pump it to say a water tower or other, so, or other location for either for storage or to begin the delivery process. We have mains, so we have a feeder main that brings it to the community, and then distribution mains bring it to the different types of offices that we're working with. So again, either we have residential or commercial. And then the service main goes directly from the distribution main to, say, a home or an office. Now, in order for the system to work properly, we have to maintain certain types of pressures. The normal pressure should range from 60 to 65. At the very minimum, we should have 35 PSI. And we shouldn't exceed 90 PSI, otherwise we may cause the system to rupture. Now finally, I would ask everyone to take a very, very short, to look at, at that liquid assets video again, and to only concentrate on a little over a minute of the video. And the reason why is it highlights specifically the New York City water treatment system and what the different types of construction we're doing. So I'd ask you to consider these two questions. How many billion gallons of water are required per day for New York City? Number two, there are currently how many water tunnels that bring water to New York City because one water tunnel is currently being constructed and it's been under construction for the past 30 years. If you're interested in the construction of the water tunnel number three, you can go and look at what the, the current construction is and the status of that tunnel. Now what are your to-dos? Again, please make sure you go, to, go do quiz number seven before the due date. Also, please move on to homework number seven. Homework number six was very straightforward and very simple. All you were asked to do was to design the rapid mixer. Now you're being asked to design the flocculation tank, sedimentation tank, sedimentation tank, and the filters. And again, we are assuming that our water treatment plant will be in approximately this area at the Fairview outlet. Again, I thank you and good luck with the homework.